Welcome to the 2021 Jean Wilsford lecture, Woodson Lecture. I am Dr. Lucy Turnbull. I'm only an honorary doctor, so I don't call myself that very often, only when I do things at UNSW. And behalf of the School of Built Environment within the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture, I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker for this special address. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who were the original custodians of this land, which they were looking after for at least 60, 70, 80,000 years before the Europeans arrived in 1788. So I'm speaking to you from Gadigal country today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that, that we all meet on from all around Australia and indeed the world today, wherever we are, across country and around the world and pay our respects to our elders past, present and emerging. And before I introduce our key speaker, which is my, my, my main job here today, I'd like to briefly acknowledge Jean Wilsford and her remarkable legacy after whom this Utsun speech is named. Jean Wilsford graduated from the School of Architecture at Sydney University in 1945 and I'm sure she would have been the only, one of the only women in the faculty then. She moved to London to work as an architect for many years. When she returned to Australia, she came to work for the National Development Commission in Canberra, which at that time was doing really groundbreaking architecture. She developed public housing programs uh, in Woden and Belconnen and also completed many uh, Commonwealth architecture projects, including the Kingsford Bus Depot and the Cherwood Fire, Fire Station. These achievements were accomplished at a time when the built environment profession was very male dominated. Jean became not only a pioneer, but also a mentor for many young women starting their careers in architecture and design through her 50 year long career. Jean died in 2019 at the age of 98, but her influence continues today through her bequest to support, to her support of this really important lecture, which acknowledges the contribution that women make to the built environment. The Jean Wilson annual lecture recognizes the work of leaders from all around the world. We thank Jean and her family for ensuring that women's voices continue to be heard in this sector. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Penny Spark. Penny Spark is the Professor of Design History at Kingston University, London, and the Director of the Modern Interiors Research Centre. Penny has published widely in the subject of design history with a special interest in the areas of interiors, identities, gender, and taste. Penny's most recent publication is Nature Inside Plants and Flowers in the Modern Interior. As so many of us remain in lockdown in Australia, it seems pertinent to hear Penny's reflections on bringing nature into our indoor spaces. Now, I realise where I'm sitting today isn't a perfect example of having nature and indoor spaces. I apologise for that. What a wonderful opportunity, however, to hear the history of this practice and to consider its impact in our physical and emotional well-being. After Penny's lecture, I'm delighted to let you know that one of UNSW's current students, Gillian Davies, will host a Q&A session. Gillian is representing UNSW's Women in the Built Environment Society, a group of students who are seeking both to address the ongoing lack of equity in the built environment uh, industries and to promote the remarkable achievements of women working in this sector and I'm so happy there are so many women working in this sector that there can be a society at the University of New South Wales to, to discuss this and to be created. Please let me introduce Penny Spark to present the 2021 Jean Wilsford Utsun Lecture. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture today. I'm honoured to have been asked, and it gives me a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk about my new book, Nature Inside, Plants and Flowers in the Modern Interior, which was published by Yale University Press earlier this year, and I'm just showing you the cover there and the slide. I know that you have a climate change research centre in your university, 
and that it is a theme of great importance across the institution, embracing a range of the disciplines you teach and research, from the sciences to the humanities. It is, of course, the pressing topic of the early 21st century and needs to be addressed by as many people as possible. While my study is not directly focused on it, in the hope that my work can be seen to align, albeit in a modest way, with your interests, before I go into the content of my study in more depth, I would like to point out a link between my study and the subject of climate change. When, about 14 years ago, I first came to think about plants and flowers in interior spaces, it was because I was struck by their absence in writings about interiors, their apparent invisibility. Like everything else that one focuses on, however, I quickly discovered once you start seeing them, you see them everywhere. During the period I have been researching Nature Inside, the subject has increasingly come to the fore, both as a fashionable pursuit for millennials in their homes, which grew exponentially during the COVID lockdowns, and as a large scale phenomenon in commercial buildings, featuring atria and large open spaces. And on the slide I've put up, you can see on the left, um, a kind of millennials home, and then on the right, a large atrium full of plants. The popular press were quick to pick up on this and tried hard to explain it. They focused on its role in maintaining mental health and in healing the rift between human beings and the natural world that's caused by us overexploiting and under-respecting it. The latter is, in broad terms, the cause of many of our environmental problems, especially climate change. While this phenomenon was usually presented rather superficially in the press, it became the starting point for my research. And I began to read texts by eco-feminists and environmentalists to try and understand it better. That took me into writings on biophilia and work by environmental psychologists on the proven benefits of living with nature. However, I'm a design historian of the modern era who focuses on interiors. So while I wanted to use this material as a broad backcloth to my work, and I used it to help me formulate questions about why people had repeatedly brought nature inside over many centuries, I defined my task as being one of revisiting the interior design history of the modern era, that is from industrialization to the present, through the lens of the hitherto neglected plants and flowers that have inhabited so many of our interior spaces. I wanted to see how that lens stimulated new readings and what it offered to existing accounts. Conceived in this way, it was a huge ambitious project which I had to somehow make manageable. The way I did that was to attempt to get as much of an oversight as I possibly could while also finding representative case studies, which would allow me to embrace adequate levels of detail and specificity. It was a decision that meant that this study was not going to be realized quickly, and it wasn't. It took about 14, 15 years to do it. My other brief to myself was to build on previous studies I'd undertaken to ensure a level of continuity. I went back to my 1995 text which you can see the cover of here, as long as it's pink, the sexual politics of taste. And I found a section on plants and flowers in the Victorian parlor, which actually I'd forgotten about. Now this helped me to introduce the idea of gender into the new study, albeit this time as a light motif rather than a dominant theme. Very quickly, I also realized but given that in the 18th and 19th centuries, so many of the plants introduced into inside spaces in the UK and Europe were imported from the colonies, the theme of empire, which I had not fully engaged with before, was also going to be important to this work. My research took me on a long journey, parts of which I was already familiar with, 
but most of which I wasn't. It required multiple research trips abroad and work in archives, as well as more general reading across a range of fields. The narrative that I wanted to construct gradually fell into place over an extended period of time. Although I did not research the book chronologically, I knew that it would eventually present it in that way, and that is how I want to offer it to you today. One of the key themes I wanted to explore was the way in which human beings took control over the natural world by encasing it or interiorizing it. This was linked to the idea of taming nature and taming the wilderness and the discussions that have gone over many years about the relationship between nature and culture. One of the fascinations for me of nature inside is that it sits at the interface between those two concepts. That is, once they're brought inside, plants and flowers became what I call near culture, while simultaneously maintaining many of the characteristics of the natural world, things like growing, dying, attracting insects, etc. When, by the 18th century, plants and flowers became commodified, as they did, they behaved as a consequence a little like designed artifacts, and that was a necessary starting point for me. I began my account, therefore, in the era of colonization and discussed the various ways in which control was exerted over the natural world at that time, both in the exterior, through the process of landscape design, and you can see star head there on the left, which represented a form of aesthetic control, and through the scientific act of categorization and naming as represented by the work of Carl Linnaeus and others. And you can just see a page from um, one of his works there. The physical containment of plants came with their transportation aboard ships from their countries of origin. They were brought to Europe in a variety of ways, particularly in boxes designed to keep them alive, culminating in the Wardian case, which was invented in the 1830s. And you can see that on the left there. Once there, they were sold to wealthy landowners or put into botanical gardens for research purposes. Gradually, those gardens were transformed into sites of public leisure and the plants were presented accordingly, rather than in the sort of scientific way that previously been presented. In the 19th century, the public display of exotic plants was continued through their presence in conservatories that were built in numerous urban parks and you can see one example of the interior of a Liverpool conservatory on the right. In the private arena, the new exotics were placed in orangeries, greenhouses, and ultimately into conservatories built onto private houses, which preceded their entry into the domestic arena itself. And there you can see on the left, Sans Souci orangery, and on the right, a conservatory attached to a house of 1895. Now, the entry of plants into the middle class British home, which, which was one of the earliest examples, came in the first decades of the 19th century, coinciding with the rapid urbanization of that time. Driven by the expanding availability of exotic plants, things like Kentia palms from Norfolk Island in the South Pacific, and the cheaper indigenous ferns among them, and you can see on the left an interior with a, with, a, with, sorry, with a palm and on the right one with some very luxuriant ferns. So nature inside became a hugely popular aspect of the interior decor of the Victorian home. I'm just going to show you a couple more sets of images of that. Um, on the left, um, ferns in a fireplace and on the right, a painting with an ivy climbing round a window. And yet another one, very, very popular combining aquaria with plants and also an arrangement of windows of, of baskets hanging in a window. Very, very popular. So nature inside softened architectural frames, lightened heavy furniture, provided elegance and refinement, acted as screens, as we've just seen, and added colour, texture and scent. 
It also, interestingly, helped to introduce children to the laws of science and post-enlightenment rational thought, as well as playing a part in the self-improvement of adults. Perhaps the most important symbolic meaning of domesticated plants and flowers at that time, however, derived from the widespread Christian belief that nature was made by God himself and was therefore inherently good. Also very importantly, domesticated nature was seen as therapeutic, both in the sense that many people needed to negotiate new relationships with both the pre-industrial past and the modern industrial present and future, and because living nature could act as a companion to those who needed it. And very often widows, the sick, were described as being people who were in need of the company of plants. The apprehension and fear of raw nature's power was, in this domestic context, replaced by a belief that nature had a calming effect on the soul. Shirley Hibbert, who wrote advice books at this time, for example, believed that nature inside was a source, quote, of rest and solace and refreshment. Interestingly, also, anticipating ideas that were to become widespread in the early 21st century, the author of an 1897 book explained that indoor plants, quote, preserve the purity of the air by removing the poisonous gas evolved by animals and the combustion of hydrocarbons and maintain the equilibrium of nature. So they were conscious not only of the psychological, but also of the physical benefits of nature in the inside spaces. Given the gendered as feminine nature of the Victorian middle-class home, nature inside took on that gendered meaning, a fact that was widely recognized in the vast numbers of advice books that were published through the 19th century. In brief, nature inside constituted a key component of the complex and sophisticated notion of domesticity that emerged at that time, and which arguably has remained in place in one form or another until the present day. My study sees this period, therefore, the Victorian period, as a defining one for an understanding of nature inside, and it was engaged with and negotiated in a variety of ways. One of the immediate ways in which Victorian domesticity, as represented by nature inside, was influential, was not only inside the home, but also in the interior spaces of numerous leisure buildings and complexes named winter gardens, which were constructed to encourage people out of their homes and into the public arena. The alignment of many English structures of this sort with horticulture initiated a widespread interest in nature inside in the public arena. The Crystal Palace of 1851, which you see on the transept of the, on the left, which was modeled on a greenhouse that Joseph Paxton had previously built at Chatsworth House, provided the stimulus for both the expansion of home conservatories, but also for a number of large scale public leisure spaces. In London, Examples included the Royal Aquarium, which you see on the right, which was in Westminster, and the People's Palace in the East End, both of which contained winter gardens. Such was the fashionable appeal of such spaces that many small scale versions, complete with plants, soon appeared in hotels, restaurants, department stores, and ocean going liners among other commercially defined interior spaces. And there you've got two examples, one in San Francisco, a Palm Court, and another in Great Yarmouth at the seaside, 1903 in, in England. In fact, nowhere were winter gardens more popular than at the seaside, the destination for many Victorian holidaymakers. In essence, the sense of calm recognized by Hibbert that nature inside induced and the safe atmosphere of feminine domesticity that it conveyed proved the ideal way of attracting people, especially women, out of their homes and encouraged them, them to spend money. This instrumentalized version of nature inside in commercial settings proved long lasting and can still be found today 
in many retail outlets and interiors linked to hospitality. And just two examples there, um, Barcelona, the shop urban outfit is filled with plants and um, an Australian example of a Thai eating house, again, using plants. Now, as it was openly embraced in the Victorian era, researching nature inside at that time proved relatively straightforward. However, I also wanted to see what happened to the legacy of that very rich cultural phenomenon in the 20th century. Clearly on one level, the cluttered Victorian interior has been revived in different contexts from the 19th century onwards to the present, often complete with nature inside. And I think one thinks, for example, of 1970s um, hanging, hanging macrame containers of plants and, and other examples. A bigger challenge, however, for me as a researcher, was to confront the overt rejection of Victorianism and its inward-looking interior that occurred with the rise of modernist architecture and design in the early 20th century. If nature inside was a key component of domesticity, I asked, did it survive the shift in architectural and design thinking that repudiated that latter concept to a significant extent. Given that this question hadn't been asked before in that way, and that nearly all the accounts of modernist architecture and design um, omit any mention of plants and flowers, did this mean that modernist interiors didn't contain any? That was a big question I had to ask. If by any chance they did, I also asked, did the meanings embedded in them in the 19th century remain in place or were they transformed beyond recognition? My quest into this arena revealed many examples of modest buildings that had contained plants and flowers. I'm just gonna give you a few examples today, including designs by, on the left hand, Sharoon, on the right, Walter Gropius. You can see they've both got contained conservatories in them. Other examples, um, Marcel Breuer, his very well-known uh, I mean, Piscato house, which is usually not shown from this angle, but when seen from this angle, you can see the, the cacti on that little shelf there. And on the right, Alva Alto's home, uh, his own home in Helsinki, which was filled with plants. Very often, palms and ferns were replaced by cacti and other more sculptural plants. What became clear as I analyzed the cases on modernist nature inside that I found, was that in this new context, it had largely lost its religious symbolism and its educational role, and had taken on another very important role in underpinning architects and designers' spatial strategies, especially in creating the porousness between inside and outside that was so central to the modernist's vision. And I'll give you some examples of this in a moment. This served to disrupt the notion of enclosure and to allow their architecture to open up to the landscape outside. In that sense, therefore, plants and flowers performed exactly the opposite role to the function that they had in the Victorian home, where it had reinforced a sense of enclosed domesticity. In the modernist context, Bringing plants in brought the outside in and also took the eye from the inside to the outside. And I'll demonstrate this in a moment. The softness of plants also provided a very strong visual contrast to the otherwise cold appearance of steel and concrete, which were so widely used. I also felt, however, that in some of these interiors, a vestigial domesticity remained in place which helped make the inside spaces inhabitable. Nowhere was this more apparent than in Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's Villa Tugendhat, built in Brno in 1929 to 30, which is one of the case studies in the book, and I devote a whole chapter to it. I included it because not only do archive pictures show many plants and flowers in the space, a large conservatory filled with plants flanks the entire eastern side of the building. And there you can see a, a, a sort of almost present day image 
on the outside showing that conservatory down the east side. And on the right, you're in the open floor, open plan um, first floor of the building. And if you look at right to the sort of far distance, you can see the um, conservatory contained behind glass, but visible from that space. To date, in spite of its size and visual prominence in many images taken of the open plan first floor of the building, this conservatory has received practically no mention in accounts of the villa, most of which stress its technological inventiveness. I also use the study of the Villa Tugendhat to provide specific details about the inclusion of individual plants in the interior space. And I'm going to give you a little more, quite a bit of detail about one specific example, which I'll show you. For example, as one enters the villa, at the top of the staircase leading to the floor below, a complex set of planes, surfaces, forms, materials, and spaces converged with each other. And you can see this here if you sort of study this with me. To add to that complexity, one of the internal chromed steel covered columns that supported the building passed through the midst of that convergence. The meeting point of the horizontal floor, which stopped sharply at right angle as the stairwell fell away beneath it, and the vertical column was made even more complex by its proximity to the end point of the glazed drum, which you can see behind, and the presence of a rail made of two horizontal rows, rows of steel bars, which acted as protection from the otherwise open stairwell. I hope you can take in the complexity of that, that particular spatial moment. An early photograph, which you can see on the left, depicted a potted maple strategically placed on the floor at the point at which all those elements met, softening the hard geometry and the materials that it neighbored. Also, arguably, it provided a visual resolution or perhaps a distraction to the spatial complexity of the combination of verticals, horizontals, curves, straight lines, masses and voids and the multiple materials that all came together at that point. The maple in question was fairly large. Its soft, full leaves and loosely defined form provided a counterpoint to the formal complexity of what had undoubtedly been an architectural challenge and an interior challenge. What may have seemed a minor addition, the plant, or even an afterthought, I think suggests the way in which nature was being used in the villa as a means, that is, of resolving complex visual challenges and of enhancing its architectural form. In recognition, I think, of that architectural and compositional importance, a similar plant was positioned in the same place in the 2012 reconfig reconfigured villa. And you can see that one on the right. I think you know it's not just put there as a decorative afterthought. I think it's put there because it's understood as being compositionally so important. The plant also raises the question about who added it to the villa. Did the architect see its presence as important? Did the photographer, a man called De Sandalo, feel it was a photographic requirement? Or did a member of the Tugendhat family feel that it provided a picturesque punctuation mark that was needed in that location? On one level, given that interiors are always the results of the work of multiple agents, those questions are irrelevant. What is important rather is to recognize its primarily formal function in that architectural and interior setting. Not only did it reinforce the spatial strategies at play, it also added texture, color, and decoration. It is also possible, and I'm stretching this, this example quite far because I think it's a, it's a good one. It's also possible that the maple brought a level of conventional domesticity into that otherwise technologically progressive space. The Tugendhat family spent many happy years at the villa before they had to emigrate to the US. So it seems that a level of domesticity and easy inhabitability did exist there. The plants and flowers, of which there were many, too many to show you here today, so key to the concept of domesticity as defined by the Victorians, undoubtedly played a part in that. I've described these aspects of the Villa Tugendhat in some detail as they demonstrate the way in which plants and flowers 
can be seen as intrinsic to certain examples of pre-war, pre-Second World War, that is, modernist residential architecture. In the following section of the book, and I'm moving on chronologically now, the emphasis shifts from the pre-war to the post-Second World War years and from Europe to the USA, where modernism and the natural world became increasingly closely aligned with each other. The focus is firstly on the mid-century modern houses that were built on the West Coast in the years after 1945. I'll put you up an example so you can see the, the Eames house there, which I'm sure you know is one of many. The warm temperate climate of that location permitted the inside-outside obsession of modernist architectures to become a reality rather than a dream. People could actually live outside their homes as well as in them. Plants and flowers were used to realize that ambiguity that was so important to these buildings. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the case study houses, especially case study house eight, designed by Charles and Ray Eames, which you can see here. Plants were added around the perimeter of the house, and you can just see those if you look at the central um, exterior wall and the plants at, at its foot. They were used to blur the boundary between inside and outside. The photographer, Julia Schulman, who, who made some amazing photographs of this building, emphasized that strategy and I think perhaps even extended it in the images he created of the interior of the house, in which plants both framed the um, space and took the eye into the distance. And you can see that in the right hand image, which is a, a Schulman image. You can see the plant right at, right at the front and then you can see the plant in the, in the background, which shows you the entrance to the outside. So he, he's not only are those plants used to do that by the Eameses, Shulman is kind of positioning his camera in such a way to emphasize it. So he emphasizes the, those strategies. Other case study houses, I'll give more examples here, um, used other strategies to do a similar thing. They either planted nature directly into internal beds stuck directly into the earth. And you can see this here in the Sperriano, um interior on the left or they place them strategically to emphasize distinct areas in otherwise open spaces among other strategies. And you can see that um, in the house on the right where the, um, the plants are used to demarcate spaces, whether that be the, the carport or the, the dining area. Now, while nature played a key role in many West Coast modernist domestic spaces, it also defined a new kind of public interior that accompanied the expansion of corporate capitalism in America at the same time. This took the form of dramatic planting schemes in hospitality interiors, shopping malls, office and, and hotel atria, amongst another, a range of other, other large scale spaces. While the use of plants at home recalled Victorian domesticity, its use in these commercial spaces echoed the way in which um, we saw them used in 19th century exhibition halls and palm courts. The same motivation was in place, that is to make consumers feel relaxed and willing to part with their money. The examples I use in my chapter include the Four Seasons restaurant in New York, which has these changing enormous trees, changing with the season inside. The North Park Shopping Center in Dallas, which I'm sorry, I moved too quickly there. Um, which you can see on the right, which was an amazing um, mile built in the 60s, which was full of very innovative uses of indoor plantings. And then also I talk about the indoor garden at the Ford Foundation building in New York, which was an incredible building, um, which I think I'll leave you to read the book to, to get the details of it. it it's, it's a great story. The scale of these undertakings required the skills of architects, landscape architects, and horticulturalists working together. However, a new multi-skilled professional specialist also joined the team now, known alternatively as an interior landscaper, a plantscaper, or an interior scaper. And these words all began to emerge around the same time. One of the pioneers in this field, a man called Everett Conklin, worked on both the Four Seasons and the Ford Foundation Garden, and he became um, a leading figure through, through the sixes um, and, and, and beyond. 
In order to emphasize the scale of these commercial operations and the plants they contained, I devote one whole chapter of the book to the interior of the atrium in the Hyatt Regency Hotel opened in Atlanta in 1967, which is designed by, by John Portman. And there you can see two images of the incredible indoor space that you encounter as you enter. Now, although the hotel was heavily criticized at the time for the fact that it was inward looking and shut off from the street outside, which it was, the way in which nature inside was incorporated as part of the overall design marks it out, I think, as extremely innovative. Portman very cleverly created an interior atrium space that was simultaneously a living room and a city. And, and I think in doing this, he starts a, a trend that becomes popular way beyond his, his, his work. While the former was reinforced by pots of yellow chrysanthemums, and you have to look rather carefully at this image, just in the bottom half, you'll see a, a seating area that has a little row of, of um, plants in a, in a, a sort of a trough, and there, there his yellow, uh, we have to take it from me, they're yellow chrysanthemums. Um, and then he includes seating positions for conversation and low lighting, and that those, all those things reinforce its, its, its a kind of living room. The latter, the city quality, was defined by the inclusion of fully grown Australian umbrella trees, which you can see at the four corners of that sitting area, quarry tiles on the floor, and the addition of lifts, which looked as if they were outside rather than inside. So as you come into this indoor space, which has a glazed top, um, the lifts look as if they're outside, but of course they're outside inside. So he's creating that spatial and um, scale ambiguity. When the hotel opened, there were 110 philodendrons cascading down from each floor. And you can, on the left, you can see the green. Um, unfortunately, I haven't found slides where they're flowing in great um, luxuriance, but in fact, they did. They, were, they flowed right down the side of, the, of those balconies. And the number grew significantly over time. The idea of using them was envisaged from the moment of the conception of the building. And, and I, I like to emphasize in the book that a lot of these things are not afterthoughts, they're actually designed in. And the modular concrete structures used for the balconies outside the guest rooms, which you see on the right, were specially designed to accommodate these philodendrons. As well as adding color, which on the left, I think is very clear, they also provided texture and a strong sense of movement that contrasted with the static concrete structure of the atrium's frame. They also provided an illusion, as I've suggested, for visitors of being outside. And from one perspective, they reflect, and I'm showing you the slide of Frank Lloyd Wright's um, falling water on the left, because if you look at those verandas, you can just see some plants tumbling over the side. There were in fact more than that, but I couldn't find a good image with them all. But in a sense, I think what Portman's doing is, is echoing that and putting it inside and, and Wright was one of his big heroes. Also following Wright, Portman used water to great effect in the Hyatt Regency and you can see on the right a, a fountain from which water actually flowed continuously. Okay, now while bringing nature inside had been in existence for many centuries, and due to the program of rapid urbanization in the Western world that occurred from the 18th century onwards, had experienced a significant expansion from that time onwards. By the 21st century, the rate of its growth had accelerated once again. And the last section of the book addresses nature inside as it developed in the early 21st century. So I, I come right up to the present day. So it's, it's pretty quick run through in many ways, but I think you need that period of time to be able to see the changing meanings of these plants. Now, the changes that occurred in the 21st century are as follows. Firstly, it became a global rather than just a US or European and European phenomenon. Secondly, thanks to a vast body of scientific research that was undertaken by environmental psychologists and others, the benefits to human beings of plants and flowers in inside spaces were better understood and articulated. That's really, really important. Thirdly, it was increasingly used in commercial spaces to enhance productivity and consumption. Fourthly, 
Interior scaping became a huge international industry. And fifthly, its popular symbolism became increasingly linked to the widespread interest in environmentalism. So that's the big shift. So in the 19th century, there's that religious symbolism. Um, through modernism, there's a kind of spatial functionality. And as we move into the 21st century, the link between nature inside and the environment becomes, if only symbolically, becomes incredibly strong. Now, two of the main roles that Nature Inside had been recognized as performing in the 19th century, that is having the therapeutic capacity to calm people by restoring their links to the rural past and improving interior environments physically by improving air quality primarily, remained in place in the early 21st century. The strong religious function that had been felt in the earlier century um, back in the 19th century, that is, was replaced arguably by many people, architects and designers among them, signing up to the concept of biophilia. So I see biophilia in some ways as continuing that um, 19th century uh, sort of sense of not, not exactly religiosity, but a, a sense of kind of spirituality being there. I'm going to talk a little bit about biophilia because I think it's very important to the, to the present. The psychologist Eric Fromm first used the term in his 1964 book, The Heart of Man, in which he defined it as a, this is his quote, a psychological orientation of being attracted to all that is alive and vital. And I'm just showing you two examples of a sort of contemporary um, uses or uh, commitments to biophilia, Oliver Heath and um, Norman Foster, both of whom speak extensively about their, their indebtedness to biophilia. And I think that's, that's really, really interesting. The extent to which they um, know and understand it is, is obviously, you know, up for grabs. But I think they, that they, they certainly show a deep commitment to it. Everett Conklin, the same man I mentioned before, had published a very influential, influential article in 1972 in which he outlined the idea that man was genetically programmed to be near green growing plants. He didn't actually use the word biophilia. Um, but I think he, he, he defined it in his own way. In 1984, somebody called Edward O. Wilson published a book called Biophilia, in which, like Conklin before him, he articulated an evolutionary approach, defining biophilia as, quote, the innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. Interestingly, Wilson was a biologist with a special interest in the behavior of ants. And it was while he was undertaking field work that he became aware of the calming and mysterious effect of the natural world, which he claimed, quote, is to be mastered, but never, we hope, completely, which I think is a great quote. And later in the book, he admitted that we only think we have control, therefore recognizing the importance of the agency of the natural world and the need for human beings to reestablish a balanced relationship with it, which I think is what the big discussion is around today. So along with a man called Stephen Kellett, Wilson was also one of the editors of a book entitled The Biophilia Hypothesis, which was published in 1993. So these are all sort of late 20th century, these books. Now this was formulated, biophilia was formulated as, quote, a human dependence on nature that extends far beyond the simple issues of material and physical sustenance to encompass as well the human craving for aesthetic, intellectual, cognitive, and even spiritual meaning and satisfaction. I think that's a really uh, rich quote, and I think the inclusion of spiritual meaning is, is, is indicative in that. Biophilia, it was suggested in this book, was rooted in learning that had taken place in the past and still existed in people who had lived in urban environments for several generations. So we don't have to have lived in the country to so-called remember what it was like. It's inherited that this, this is the belief of these writers. It implied that the satisfaction of that craving led to a state of psychological well-being, a reduction in stress levels and the promotion of physical health. So there's a very strong understanding of the benefits now. In the early 2020s, where we are now, the concept of biophilia is embraced very widely, 
although I have to say sometimes rather superficially. Not only is it invoked by architects, designers, and plantscapers, it is also used as a rationale by the developers of offices and large commercial spaces. It is paralleled, however, by others who invoke the physical benefits of nature inside. I just want to say a little bit about this now. Something which, as I've shown already, the Victorians already understood. Now, this side of things came to a head in the wake of a 1989 publication of a report for NASA by a man called, an engineer called Bill Wolverton, who back in 1973 had found that Skylab 3 had been contaminated with more than 300 volatile organic chemicals, VOCs as we call them now. Now, Wolverton discovered that certain species of plants, amongst them peace lilies, areca palms, lady palms, fig trees, and something called the golden pothos among them, were effective air purifiers. And he said this, since man's existence on earth depends upon a life support system involving an intricate relationship with plants and their associated microorganisms, it should be obvious that when he attempts to isolate himself in tightly sealed buildings like Skylab 3, away from this ecological system, problems will arise. So he, he's back, back in the 70s and then into the 80s, he's very conscious of the need to keep in touch with plants for, for these reasons. The result of his research showed that low light requiring, requiring house plants with activated carbon plant filters have demonstrated the potential for improving indoor air quality by removing trace organic pollutants from the air in energy efficient buildings. And this is something that's quoted often now. Now, unfortunately, there is a great deal of media hype in the contemporary claims that nature inside removes pollution, as it would take um, at least 100 mother-in-law's tongues, if you know this plants with this sort of spiky tops, would take at least 100 of them to make the smallest impact on the environment. So it is rather um, over, overemphasized. However, this is important, it suits us to believe that we can turn to nature to heal the problems that we have caused by abusing it. So I think that's, that's the bottom line. Okay, in conclusion, nature inside is here to stay for the foreseeable future. And architects and interior designers will be working with plantscapers and horticulturalists to facilitate many of the future's green interiors. I hope by exploring some of the different ways in which it has worked in the past, and understanding that on one level, it represents human beings continuing to exploit nature to their own ends, that those architects and designers will be able to do their work sensitively and with integrity. Thank you very much for listening. Good evening, my name is Gillian Davies. I'm a third year Bachelor of Landscape Architecture student at UNSW and a member of UNSW's Women in the Built Environment Society. We are a society that promotes a community that is equal and creating a safe space for women in the built environment to feel supported and encouraged in leadership roles. I've been asked by our head of school Associate Professor Philip Oldfield to thank Professor Spark and to host a short question and answer session at the end of this, the Jean Wilsford Utsen Lecture. What a delight it is to thank you for your address, Professor Spark. As a third year student at the School of Built Environment, I've learned so much about designing green spaces, both in our exterior and interior worlds, but I've never fully appreciated the history of how we have learnt to bring nature inside. I now have a greater appreciation of how we have considered our green spaces and what we have gained from drawing closer to the natural world. I really enjoyed your research methodology and your reflection on your previous publications, especially your book, As Long As It's Pink. It reminded me of the fact that design is political and it really shapes our world. I'd like to now move on to a number of questions that have been pre-submitted by our audience. Thank you to everyone who shared their questions. We'll try and get through as many as possible before our time runs out this evening. For our first question, Rosalie, a UNSW alumna asks, do you think in the current lockdowns, we are looking more at digital nature rather than real nature? 
Mm, it's a really good question. Um, I don't really know the answer to it, but but I know a lot of people have been looking at Instagram images of plants in, in their rooms and things. Um, and maybe that's that's fine. Um, in fact, there is an argument that looking at look, images of nature has a beneficial effect, a psychological effect, and even maybe a physical effect. Maybe it calms you down just to look at images. But of course, it's not the same as being in nature because you don't get the, the physical effects um, and that you don't get things like smell and texture. So I think if we have been looking only at, um, at digital images, then we, we need to make sure we balance that by actually looking at the real thing. That makes so much sense. So moving on to our next question, this is from the Women in Built Environment Society. With more women participating and leading design, how can we expect interior spaces to evolve, especially in regards to bringing nature indoors? Uh, yes, that's, a, that's another really interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it will have that effect. I, I, I think, as I said in my lecture, that there is a sort of a gendered aspect to this. Of course, that doesn't mean that that's just women who <laughs> experience it or create it, because femininity is, is a quality that crosses, you know, across genders. Um, we all have some feminine in, in us. And I, but I, I would like to maintain the idea that there is a feminine nature to nature inside but that it's something we can all share with. And I think the increasing number of women involved in creating interiors will help that um, be the norm. Yeah, that's so great. That's so great to hear, especially for our future. Um, so moving on to our next question. This is from Johnny, a current student. He asks, why does the use of indoor plants come in and out of fashion in interior architecture? Do they go out of fashion when we lose connection with the natural world? Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting thing to think about. To, to, how, why does it go up and down? And it does, even though it's there constantly, I think, on one level. As, as a fashion, it does, you're right, fluctuate. I think it's almost the opposite of what's being suggested here, that rather than us wanting nature inside um, when and losing losing our link with nature when when and, and it, meaning we don't use nature inside is, is that we need nature inside when we've lost nature and that's true very much in the victorian period when they moved from the country to the city that the first thing they wanted to do was to bring something of that of nature into their own homes and i think today we have that same fear that we're actually losing our our real links with the natural world and, and hence the involvement there's also the sense that um, you know, maybe nature's as much a threat as it can be a calming and a delight to live with. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the pandemic is us falling out with nature, maybe the, oh, well, definitely the, the, the wild uh, climate change that we're experiencing is, is not nature's best side. It's, it's maybe, you know, maybe revenge for what we've done for it, to it, I don't know. But um, there's a kind of complex relationship between our, our relationship with nature and our, and our desire to bring nature inside. I don't think it's that simple. Okay. Thank you, Penny. Our next question is from Nicholas, a UNSW alumnus. IAQ and biophilic installations may be at odds because of pathogens and mold from increased humidity. Can an office have too much green? <laughs> That's a very good question as well. Um, you do see some offices that you know look like jungles; they're absolutely full. Um, and of course, the challenge to having live nature in an office is maintenance and keeping them alive and keeping them flourishing, and that involves financial and time commitment. So um, there is a, there is a downside, and of course, the things you've mentioned the um, the mould and humidity are, are potentials that have to be controlled. But it's interesting now, I think, um, and I was sort of think about the present day, that in the hopefully soon post-COVID period, um, big offices are actually investing heavily in green spaces, mainly to attract people back into the office because they've been working from home. So in spite of the downsides, which are expensive um, that investment is still very very visible and I think will continue to be for the foreseeable future yeah that that's a really good insight thank you Penny due to time constraints we only have time for one question left um, and this question is from Jude a current student 
At what stage in history do you feel that indoor plants stopped only being associated with femininity? Do you feel we have reached a time where the appreciation of bringing nature inside is shared across all genders and orientations? Yes, of course it is. It is shared across everybody. <laughs> um, but just to pick up the point I made a little bit earlier, I think that still the notion of femininity is embedded in nature. We, we call nature she. It's, it's feminized whenever we use it. So that's a kind of cultural legacy, I think, that's still there. It doesn't mean to say only women can appreciate it or work with it. Of course, in the Victorian period, it was the women who brought um, or certainly used nature as part of the decor. They were the ones who envisaged the decorative spaces and who worked with those plants and who benefited perhaps most from them. And of course, that's ex extended now so that we all do. But I still want to think of there being a sort of feminine inherent sort of core to nature and to nature inside. Thank you, Penny. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time this evening and we'll finish up now. So I'd like to thank Lucy Turnbull for providing such a great introduction to this lecture and extend our warmest thanks to Professor Spark for joining us from her home in London and sharing her great insights into bringing nature inside. Thank you to everyone who has joined us this evening. If you missed the beginning of this lecture or would like to watch it again, it is now available for on-demand viewing at any time. Please stay in touch with UNSW School of the Built Environment and thank you again for being here tonight.